It's Friday, April 12. This is the news on PBCJ. I am Simone Absalom. The Office of Utilities Regulation, OUR, has granted permission for the National Water Commission, the NWC, to suspend for three months two guaranteed standards pertaining to meter installation as well as meter repair or replacement. The two guaranteed standards state that the NWC should install a meter on a customer's request within 30 days and give the Water Commission a maximum 20 working days to verify, repair or replace a meter after being notified of a defect. The news release from the OUR on Thursday said that the suspension of the two standards takes effect on April 15 and will end on July 15. Jamaica has expanded trade relations with China after this week's signing of a landmark Memorandum of Understanding. First announced in 2013, Beijing has touted the Belt and Road Initiative as an international development strategy through which China seeks to leverage partnerships in a build-out of its economic and geopolitical power. Chinese Ambassador to Jamaica Tian Shi said that the signing of yesterday's Memorandum of Understanding on the BRI would raise the level of bilateral cooperation to a higher bar. Jamaica now joins several Caribbean countries to ink an agreement with China for this initiative, which has brought targeted investment through many construction and service-oriented projects. Niven Mimika, Commissioner in Charge of International Cooperation and Development at the European Commission, will lead a high-level delegation to Jamaica between today and Sunday to hold regional and bilateral talks with members of CARI Forum and the Jamaican government on the successor to the Contuno Agreement, which will expire in 2020. The visit of Mamika, who is the EU's chief negotiator on the new African, Caribbean and Pacific EU partnership comes at an important juncture where negotiations between CARI Forum and the EU to create a modern partnership beyond 2020 have formally commenced. Attorney at law Shirley Richards is warning that even a partial legalization of abortion, such as for medical reasons, could possibly open up a loophole for wholesale abortion in the country. She cited the example of Canada, where there, under the Canada Health Act, there is no legal restriction, meaning a pregnancy can be terminated at any stage. The current legal situation in Canada it has lessons for us as the, because of the similarity of the constitutional provisions between Canada and our own country. You see, Canada also has a chart of rights. In Canada, one such loophole was opened up with respect to abortions. Effectively, eventually, and inevitably, all restrictions on abortions were eroded. And right now, there are no restrictions at all. This means that even sex selection abortions are legal in Canada. Dr. Henry Morgan Taylor used Canada's chart of rights to achieve what he wanted. If we open up a similar loophole, Jamaica will very likely end up where Canada is today. You can see that Dr. Morgan Taylor kept coming back for more and more until Canada today has absolutely no restrictions at all. Before the chart of rights, attempts to remove restrictions failed. But once they had a charter of rights, which is very similar to ours, they were able to remove all restrictions. This committee, therefore, needs to, therefore be, needs to be aware that persons who push for abortion will not be satisfied with the exceptions which you may be thinking of, example, to allow for the killing of the embryonic human being. For once that door is opened, it very likely will be pushed wide open as persons exercise what is perceived as a right to kill the unborn child. The attorney referenced existing laws in Jamaica and how abortion would legally violate or charter of rights. The morality of abortion was also challenged. We note with disappointment that the honorable member has sought, has sought to couch her motion which would result in the destruction of human life within the concept of morality. 
This use of the concept of morality to cloak this terribly unnatural practice of a woman taking the life of her own child is highly regrettable. Abortion is a moral issue. No law that seeks to justify same can wipe away the blood. To again quote from Mrs. Benka Coker, QC, the passage of laws will not make moral that which is basically immoral, end of quote. She was speaking on Wednesday at the Human Resource and Social Development Committee in the House of Representatives. The committee is considering a private member motion brought by Member of Parliament Juliet Cuthbert Flynn for the legalization of abortion. The Child Protection and Family Services Agency is imploring parents to get children screened early if they show any sign of a disability or developmental challenge so that the appropriate interventions can be applied. The CPFSA's Director for Financial Management and Accounting Services, Michelle McIntosh, said there are entities that provide the necessary screening to determine the type of challenges a child may be exhibiting and can help determine the correct treatment that is required. She was speaking at the media launch of the third staging of the Nathan Banks Foundation Family Expo and Special Needs Resource Fair this week at the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. A cardiac center is to be officially opened at the Bustamante Hospital for Children next Monday. The state-of-the-art facility will be equipped with a catheterization laboratory or cath lab, operating room and an intensive care unit. According to the release from the Southeast Regional Health Authority, the establishment of the center is significant as this is the only one of its kind in Jamaica and the wider English-speaking Caribbean. The center is said to be part of a multi-million dollar investment made by several partners in enhancing the delivery of cardiovascular services. Community tourism island-wide will receive a major boost following the commitment of approximately $300 million by Minister of Tourism Edmund Bartlett. The tourism minister said the money will be disbursed to 63 communities across the country to have small events and activities to attract more visitors and to increase potential earnings of small tourism suppliers. According to Bartlett, these community tourism projects will provide authentic Jamaican experiences, whether it be food or entertainment for our visitors, and increase earnings for our suppliers. The announcement was made yesterday during the official launch of M Academy at the Chinese Benevolent Center in Kingston. Jamaica's Chief Army Officer, Lieutenant General Rocky Meade, was among three military leaders inducted into the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College's International Hall of Fame at the Lewis and Clark Center, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, on April 4. Meade, who is Chief of Defense Staff at the Jamaica Defense Force, was recognized for a myriad of accomplishments achieved as part of his service to the Army and the country. Among other degrees, Meade holds a Master's of Military Arts and Science degree from the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College and a Ph.D. from the University of Amsterdam. The U.S. Embassy's senior defense official, attaché, Lieutenant Colonel Pablo Raggio, accompanied him to the ceremony. The National Security Ministry has announced that retired Lieutenant Colonel Gary Rowe is the new Commissioner of Corrections. This follows the transfer of Ina Hunter to the post of Chief Program Officer in the ministry effective yesterday. The ministry said Colonel Rowe served as official officer in the Jamaica Defense Force for 32 years and amassed a wealth of security and management expertise. The Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority has challenged claims by flight school operator that the agency relied on false information in its probe into the deadly November 2016 Cessna airplane crash in Greenwich Town, Kingston. It is also maintaining that all its investigations were carried out according to international standards. On Monday, the Gleaner reported that Captain Errol Stewart, the operator of the Caribbean Aviation Training Center, had taken issue with the final report into the crash that killed flight instructor Captain Jonathan Wharton and student pilots Dojanvar Gilmore, 
who is 19 years old, and Ramon Forbes, 17 years old. The report concluded, among other things, that wrong and malfunctioning parts were fitted to the engine of the ill-fated aircraft. But at a press conference Thursday morning, JCAA Chairman Philip Henriquez and Director General Nari Williams-Singh rejected those claims. The U.S. dollar on Thursday ended trading at Jamaican $131.66, up by a dollar. That's according to the Bank of Jamaica's daily foreign exchange trading summary. The summary also recorded the Canadian dollar ending trading at Jamaican $99.43, down from $99.63, while the British pound sterling ended trading at Jamaican $169.72, down from Jamaican $170.58. In regional news, Venezuelans fleeing the turmoil in their country are being offered a chance to live and work in Trinidad and Tobago legally. On Thursday, National Security Minister Stuart Young announced the creation of a registration system that will open for a two-week period. Whether Venezuelans are here legally or illegally, once they come into the window of that two-week period and they register, they will derive the opportunity to get a registration card. They will have a work permit exemption permitting them to work for a year, but not an automatic year. At the end of six months, they must come into wherever we tell them their supervisory officers will be. They must come and provide us with further information as what has happened over that six-month period. And then they may be granted an extension for another six-month period. So they will be those Venezuelans, whether you're here illegal or illegally or legally, once you register in this two-week window, you will be permitted the opportunity to work for up to a year with a six-month increment that you'll come in and report. Stewart says that the registration card will have a photo identification and security features. He said Venezuelans will also be able to access health care. Any person who is in Trinidad and Tobago can walk into an accident and emergency department at any health center, any public hospital, and they will receive health care. So that will continue for the Venezuelans who are registered. They will also be allowed to get primary health care and public health care. And the definitions are for emergency medical services, the initial treatment of acute medical conditions such as accidents, injuries, asthma, heart attacks, strokes, diabetic coma, infectious disease, and initial stabilization of fractures. So that's the emergency medical services. Under primary health care, this initial treatment and stabilization of cases that you walk in for, the med emergency medical services. And then public health is access to health promotional material and immunization as per the national immunization efforts. Anything over and beyond those identified medical services, primary health care and public health will have to be paid for. However, the minister said that cabinet says there will be no right to education and training for Venezuelans. Also, he says there will be a review of the situation of other non-nationals being held at the immigration detention center. What the population have said, in fact, what some persons have said right here in post cabinet about our CARICOM brothers and sisters and other illegal immigrants, be it from Cuba, be it from Haiti, be them, be there from China, be, be, them, be they from African countries. So when I visited the IDC, these are some of the other nationals, non-nationals of Trinidad and Tobago, and categories of persons who were detained at the Immigration Detention Center. So I'm going to review the policy with respect to all categories of illegal immigrants in Trinidad and Tobago, including those who are detained at the IDC and those who may not be detained. And I will come back to Cabinet with a policy and suggestions as how we should treat with them. It is foreseen that that process, if cabinet is so minded, and I think they will be minded to consider a policy, will also have a cutoff date. Guyana's police commissioner, Leslie James, has issued a strong warning to police officers to stop accepting bribes from members of the public. He also warned of prosecution for those that offered bribes. We get the details from this HGP Nightly News. 
For the past several years and even now, the acceptance of bribes and incentives have landed junior and senior police ranks before the courts. Some have also been prosecuted for this act. But it seems despite actions being taken against officers who accept bribes, the problem still exists, tarnishing the image of the force which is currently trying to reform itself under new management. During his remarks at a recent event, Commissioner of Police Leslie James expressed utter disdain at the fact that officers are still indulging in this callous practice. And let me warn you, the civilians, we'll be coming after you, those of you who are offering. You can't be offering to police and then say the police take him right. It is simple. Do not commit offenses. If you do not have a tin permit, you just cannot carry a tin on your vehicle. The police commissioner further added that without an offer, there can't be an acceptance. He further noted that for years, those accusing officers of bribery are often offering incentives and have not faced the law for their actions. So the police bus stops you, force you onto an offense, and you decide to make that offer, and the corrupt police decide to take, both of you are culpable. The offer and the person who accepted. I'm going to engage particular departments in the force first of pursue a particular exercise to deal with this coach. The top cop spoke specifically to traffic ranks, who he said are the ones who are most times accused of bribery. He affirmed that persons who offer bribes will not be encouraged to tarnish the force. It is not a one-way exercise. Offer and acceptance. And you, the police ranks, if you're not comfortable with your salaries, leave the job. In sports, we bowl off with cricket. Former Jamaica West Indies leg spinner Robert Haynes will replace Courtney Brown as interim head of selectors of Cricket West Indies. The move was confirmed on Thursday as part of a shakeup announced by the new CWI president, Ricky Skerritt. We're confident that in Mr. Haynes, we have found an interim chairman who shares the philosophy of inclusiveness and therefore believes in our new selection policy. Because of his impressive track record of good relations with players and past players, we have no doubt that Mr. Haynes will engage with players everywhere, strictly in the interest of what is best for West Indian cricket. Haynes said he was committed to fairness and impartiality in moving West Indies cricket forward. First of all, you have to look at the philosophy in terms of selection criteria that are required in terms of the new policy and as the chairman of selectors it is important that at all time I am fair and impartial in what I'm doing in terms of moving West Indies cricket forward. Um, it will be a case where as the chairman I will sit down with Jimmy and other stakeholders in terms of the direction that we need to go. So when I sit with my board or my panel as we say we could definitely look at the direction that we need to go in and make sure that we try at all time to select the best possible team to represent the West Indies. And it's also important that the coach and the captain, when we sit down to discuss cricket, that they have this freedom of expressing themselves, what is it they need in terms of players to represent the team, so we could sit down as a group, discuss this, and we could move forward. It was also announced that Floyd Reefo will take over as interim head coach from Richard Pibus. Pibus was placed in temporary charge earlier this year and oversaw a famous home test series victory over England. Scarrett said this move is part of the new West Indies first policy. Our West Indian first policy is no disrespect to foreign coaches. On Tuesday, our board set a new standard of not less than four out of every five members of the coaching and support staff should be of West Indian origin. This enables us to continue to have international participants working for CWI in areas where there is no one of equal quality available regionally. But wherever there are foreign coaches in our system, we will be undertaking a clear succession plan 
for local replacement. Developing and exposing regional expertise in coaching is a high priority for the future of our cricket. Our landmark decision to immediately introduce a well-suited young West Indian professional as our men's team coach is therefore a clear indicator of the seriousness of our West Indian First policy and represents our commitment to celebrate the best of what it means to be West Indian. In the meantime, Director of Cricket Jimmy Adams welcomed the new direction. I've always maintained that um, with the resources that we have, we can't afford to exclude uh, any sort of um, expertise that we have in the region, whether it be playing expertise or coaching expertise. Uh, my record in the region will, will speak to how passionate I am about developing our regional coaches as well as our players. And to this end, I think uh, what we have started here is a fantastic opportunity because it gives hope, gives motivation, and it should inspire not just the regional players, but also the coaches in the region that we have a pathway that will take them all the way to the top and that there won't be any hindrances along the way. And that's the news on PBC Day. Remember, we are the People's Station.